uh, starting on time, we need to respect everyone's time. Uh, so today we're going through why having a firewall antivirus is not enough. Uh, it just seems like I'm hearing about companies and, and clients and potential clients getting hacked sort of right, left and center, whether it's personally, uh, funds getting stolen, computers getting compromised, worried about their passwords, phishing emails. So this is an important topic today in IT, especially with people working from home, there's a lot more ransomware and phishing emails going on. So we are hosting this. And yeah, we have all sorts of uh, people on the call today from almost around the world. We have people registered from three different countries for the webinar today, ranging from executives, CEOs, decision makers, IT managers, CTOs, and uh, end users on networks, uh, whether it's finance, HR, or other admin or management roles. So welcome to everyone. A uh, couple uh, housekeeping things. Uh, yeah, please uh, post in the chat. Uh, two things, uh, city you're connecting from and your biggest fear when it comes to security. And you can put questions in the question section below, um, down below, and we'll get to them at the end. Uh, so yeah, we'll love to hear where you're all from and what are you hoping to get out of the webinar today and what are some of your fears? So introductions, uh, today we have Ian. Who's our, who leads up our Windows team under the, for Kirkoff Technologies and is the system engineer. So he's working closely with our team and our clients and technology around all sorts of policies and technologies. Curtis is in our Linux team, uh, also known as the Crafty Penguins division. And um, he's an ethical hacker. He's actually working on a certification for that, which means uh, working with clients with their permission to hack into the networks to find vulnerabilities and then provide solutions to patch those. And finally, myself, I'm the founder and CEO of Kirkoff Technologies and Crafty Penguins. All right, so yeah, why are we doing this? Uh, as I mentioned, we're seeing companies getting compromised even when they have a firewall and antivirus in place, which is pretty much everyone out there these days. And small companies are often a higher risk than larger ones because they don't have dedicated teams and engineers to look at security and, and watch these things. So we can be a soft belly and a sitting duck. <clears throat> Ransoms are going up and up. It's not thousands of dollars. It's into six digits now for some companies in some situations. And insurance is only uh, a small partial answer to that. It gives you a bit of money back to cover some of your costs, but it doesn't cover reputation loss, your downtime, loss of sales and more. And security is not just about the hardware and the tools and, and a, a silver bullet like that, but it's policies, procedures, and the mindset and just taking it seriously. That will be a theme today. So why do hackers do what they do? Well, it's ransom for money. That's a big one. And typically, they will encrypt or delete your backups while they're, while they're at it and to make it really hard to recover from that so that you got to pay the ransom. And extortion is another one. It might be a jumping off point to attack other organizations like your vendor, your clients, your peers, um, other places. Uh, they want, might want to take your data and sell it online on the dark web. Or they're just going to use unused CPU cycles. Like most computers are only used like 1% of the time. Even when you're at your computer, it's only using like 5% of the CPU. So they can use that processing power to earn money. And it's just for fun. Sometimes it's ego. And there's many other reasons, but these are some of the, the, the large, uh, main ones. Okay, so key messages we want you to take away today is security is not complicated. You don't need to be scared of it. Uh, your security can be improved without a ton of investment. Just some healthy habits and mindset and education can go a long ways. The policies don't need to be overwhelming if they're created with the user in mind and implemented well. Uh, not push down their throats, but educate, do it in steps, and help them through it. And that security can be uh, really improved without slowing down the users. It doesn't need to bog them down and waste their time. And finally, make sure you have a really solid cyber uh, security insurance in place, because we actually talked, a company called us a month ago, and they'd been hacked, and we, they brought in us to help recover, and they thought they had cyber security insurance, and it turns out it wouldn't actually cover our time to recover it. So they're sending us nine grand to help with that recovery. And they, they got off light with that actually, because they had backups, but even then it took thousands of dollars to get them back up in business. So make sure you have good policies in place. And I'll get back to that later. 
So we're going to transition over to Ian and Curta, who are going to show you why antivirus and firewalls aren't enough with a live demo. So look through that process, and they'll explain the story behind that. Then after the demo, we'll go through some more actual solutions, tips, common objections to these things, and around better security. So I'm going to hand it over to these uh, gentlemen. <laughs> Great. Thanks, Wayne. Uh, okay, so for our demonstration today, what we're going to be uh, demoing is what's known as lateral movement. And we picked a theoretical organization, and we called it KTEC. So we built a, an environment in our lab. Uh, we built up a phishing website, which you'll see, and uh, Ian built up the, the networks that we'll be actually attacking. And just to be clear and above board again, um, the things that we'll be demoing, we'll be using the built-in Windows tools like the startup folders with some batch files, um, some MS fi MSI files, and you'll be seeing some pop-up windows along the way. And that was done intentionally. So yeah, you can see exactly what's going on. Uh, in reality, uh, an attacker will be trying to hide this. Uh, so Ian and I will be bouncing back and forth uh, as the attacker. Uh, it starts off with me, and I'll be sharing my screen and showing you uh, the window from an attacker point of view. Great. Okay. So to start off with, to start off with, uh, an attacker might start just by looking for an IP on the internet. He'll find an IP and he'll do a scan for it. He'll do a scan. He'll use a tool called Nmap and he'll use he'll he'll look for what are known as open ports. And these ports refer to services that are out there. So when he scans these ports, uh, he'll come up with some results. And in this case, we picked up uh, a couple open ports. And these open ports are in these high numbers. Uh, Ian will explain a little bit uh, about those just coming up. And, but we don't know what they are at this point. So what we'll do is we'll do a further scan and we'll just try to find out what kind of information we can figure out. And in this case, I am using a script and this script actually searches for RDP information, and RDP is the remote desktop protocol. And again, just to reiterate, uh, the ports that we're scanning, 3389 is the standard port for remote desktop. Uh, oftentimes, an organization might try to hide their remote desktop using the higher number ports, which are the non-standard ports, thinking that an attacker might not uh, scan them. Just because they're so, such a high number, who would take the time to really scan, out, scan that? But there are tools that are out there on the internet that do this very easily for an attacker. And the information might even be just out there available for them to pick up. So what did we find here when the when the scan ran? We found out we found a couple of computers. We found Lucy 03, and we found Jimmy 01, and we found a domain name. Now, using this information, an attacker might say, "Okay, well, if I want to target these guys a little bit more." So then they'll search on the internet. They'll find out a little bit more about this KTAC company, and decide to use the approach of, OK, we'll attack them using their human resources department. So they'll craft an email. They'll come up with an email. And I just have uh, an HTML file here. And that HTML file just holds just the text that they'll use to, uh, to send to, uh, to the company. So using just some standard tools, uh, command line tools, we'll, we'll send that HTML file as an as a email. We can send it saying that it's coming from anybody that we want. I, this is completely made up. We could say anything that we want in here. In this case, 
Gwen Fisher Daniel at Outlook.com with her name and the subject of the message. And I'm going to be sending it over to Ian. Now, Ian's going to take over here and show you just what happens on his side. All right. So this winds up being the email that is sent to uh, poor Lucy here. And it's just a pretty standard phishing email. It winds up with a faked username and our faked email address that it comes from. And inside of that email, there is a link. And this link is directing Lucy to take an action. In this case, it's going to be to download something from her OneDrive. So if Lucy went ahead and clicked on that link, she is taken to a fake Office 365 sign-in tab. So Lucy here is going to enter her credentials thinking that she's signing into Microsoft 365. And from there, the website can be redirected to just about anywhere. Uh, in this case, it just redirects back to Microsoft's own website. Um, however, in many cases, this would go to another Office 365 login page, or it could be a man in the middle page where it's passing off the credentials to a valid Microsoft 365 page. Uh, but regardless as to how it works, uh, we have some things that happened on the back end there. So let's go have a look with Curtis and see what he saw. Right, okay. So I'll show just what happened in the background. Okay, so if we switch to my screen here. Sorry, we're trying out a new webinar tool for the first time. <laughs> oh. Did we lose Wim? I think, yeah, we lost Wim. He just posted, uh, he is reconnecting. Okay. Well, I'll explain a little bit. Um, so in the background, or what happened was, Ian clicked on the link. The link went to a website. The website was a phishing website made to look uh, just like the Office 365 website login page. Um, it was something that, that we built here. I built it um, just for this demo. And the code doesn't just log you in or drop you off to Microsoft.com. It scrapes the username and pass password that poor Lucy entered into it. So uh, once Wim gets back online, I can show you the I'm file here. that it actually yeah. logged in. Can you in. hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Wim. Yep, we, we can see your screen. Oh, OK. OK, so the, the file that it drops, or it drops everything into is called usernames. And what do we find out here? We find out some source IPs. And we found out a username, and we found out a password. And these are the exact same things that that Ian just entered. Uh, now, knowing that IP, we know that we have an RDP port on there. And the next portion of our demo is going to be um, logging into that RDP port and dropping some payloads. Now that, Ian, are you able to to move on and share your screen to show that part. That's what I'm aiming to do. So let's see if this works for us. So in this particular case here, we wound up with uh, Lucy being 
compromised here and we had her username and password that was able to be scraped from the phishing email. So what we're doing next is we are going to use that to connect up to Microsoft Remote Desktop. And stop sharing that screen. All right, so what we've done here is we've logged in via remote desktop to poor Lucy's computer. And what we've done here is Lucy herself doesn't have much access to the network or anything like that. The problem is with this particular organization is that Lucy is a local administrator on her computer, most likely because she needs to run some piece of accounting software from 1995 or something like that. <laughs> so although Lucy is not able to compromise the network directly herself, we have an issue in that Lucy can compromise this local computer. So how can Lucy do that? Well, she can use that, do that using standard uh, Windows commands. So for example, here, we're going to be aiming to download a, a, do, 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 a payload file, how a paste can work. If our paste can work. <laughs> And the point of this is that an attacker would want to establish some sort of persistence on that computer to be able to repeatedly log into it. So in this particular case, we've downloaded a Windows installer that might be my remote access backdoor tools. Yeah. Let's see what else Lucy can do. Lucy can create individual files and things like that inside the Windows directory. Well, let's see what would happen if we created a file that might say copy something over to a server. Now Lucy herself doesn't have access to do that but there is somebody on this computer who does. And that is the domain administrator account. Because Lucy is a member of the local administrators on her local PC, she can force access to the profile of the domain administrator account on this local computer. Hey, look at that. And what are we going to do with this information? We're going to booby trap the startup folder on the domain administrator's account. Now, oh, this particular one here, this is the payroll payload that we actually want to get running on a server. So we're going to go ahead and do that. So now all we have to do is wait for a administrator to log into Lucy's PC. 
which could take some time. However, earlier in the demo, we got Lucy's email. So the most straightforward thing to do is probably going to be to send a support request to the IT administrator from Lucy's email. That's evil. So, what's that? That's evil. <laughs> <laughs> well, it all seems pretty likely. Oh, it so is. Now we're, it is. <clears throat> so now we're going to uh, do two things here. So I have the server in the environment here, and I'm just going to log into the server as the administrator. And I'm just going to bring up on the server the startup folder for the administrator account. And now I'm going to come over to Lucy's PC, and I'm the individual that is going to be doing Lucy's help desk request. And I'm going to log in as that administrator. And the more technical individuals will probably see where this is going fairly quickly. So Lucy didn't have access to anything in the network that really offered any, uh, any compromise other than she had access to her local computer. So what we're highlighting here as well is another reason why it's very important uh, and why this webinar was titled uh, as it was, uh, a firewall is not, a firewall and antivirus is not enough. The problem here is that a domain administrator account is being used to administer a end user's workstation. So that is another step that this organization has done wrong. And so here we can see that the login script ran when the domain administrator logged into the local workstation, and that was able to booby trap the server in the same way that we were booby trapping uh, Lucy's workstation. So now all we have to do again is wait for the domain administrator to sign back in in a way that triggers the startup folder. And we have executed a script now as the domain administrator on a server, this environment at this point would be fully compromised. So as we noted initially, uh, what we wanted to highlight was that um, we were being quite transparent and uh, above board on what it was that we were demonstrating the complexities of these attacks and the things that the attacker is able to do is obviously far more complex. And what we wanted to really highlight today was lateral movement between an online service in getting a set of credentials, um, being able to use social media, things like LinkedIn, um, using a network scanner. So in this particular case, an attacker either purchased or found information that was available on the internet that indicated that this network had remote desktop available on it. Uh, in scraping social media, they may have found out that Lucy was an HR administrator for the company and the KTEC was hiring. Uh, so there's a spear phishing email that went to Lucy indicating that she needed to click on a link. She clicked on the link and entered her credentials. And once the uh, credentials were compromised, 
we now had a way to access her PC via remote desktop. When we got onto the remote desktop, we found that Lucy was a local administrator on her PC. So using that, we created a backdoor on the PC and we booby-trapped the domain administrator's account. Send, using her email that we fished earlier, we send a request for support and the administrator logs in. That triggers the script to be copied to the administrator's account. The administrator logs in and compromises the server. Um, that in a nutshell is lateral movement and an escalation of privilege inside of a network. Yep. And just to reiterate, um, this is just one technique that an attacker might take to get into your network. Um, there's a whole different path that someone might start off with and someone might use to get in there. And these techniques, um, what we demonstrated was, was very basic, as Ian was just saying. Um, there are certainly more sophisticated ways, ways that'll trick you a little bit further. Uh, just as one example, the domain that we went to, um, the site that we built was just an HTTP site. It might have been an HTTPS site hosted on a Microsoft, um, a Microsoft actual website where Microsoft puts their certificate on the site. Uh, you might look at the certificate, see it comes from Microsoft, but it's not actually a site, it's a phishing site. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so there was, um, Terry, should we go, did you kind of get what happened there, Terry, with the password list? No, that some of the screen sharing was glitchy there, so we, some of the pieces may have gotten connected. Yeah, he's got it, okay. Yeah, so I was kind of blown away by what Curtis and Ian showed me, um, that these bits and pieces of information, like open ports and passwords and email addresses and domains, is can be bought because this whole uh, crime is a business. And just like there is with um, manufacturing, you get all different sorts of suppliers providing di um, different tools and supplies and everything to, to build your widgets, that's happening in this industry as well. There's people just doing scanning, other companies just doing um actual compromising or holding the ransoms and moving the money around so it's a it's a business these people wake up in the morning and they go to work to to hack and do these nefarious things okay um yeah so yeah please uh, continue to post questions in the chat about security or what we've done here or anything else and we'll get to it at the end reminder on that to the questions are down below um okay uh ian um, yeah, we we're just going to talk a little bit about the, uh, the number of or ways that organizations get hacked. Um, we go to a lot of seminars. We talk with a lot of other MSPs and security professionals. And the number one way by far that organizations uh, are being compromised today is with open remote desktop uh, or some other remote access tool that is available on the open internet and available to be compromised. Um, so that is a, a really big takeaway for anybody that is still using this kind of technique that we demonstrated at the beginning where you've got uh, open RDP on the internet, but you're throwing it up on a high level uh, random port. It's just security through obscurity and eventually somebody will find you. Um, Weak passwords and phishing emails is the second most common way that organizations are being attacked. Um, it's a lot easier to hack a person sometimes than it is to hack a computer. Uh, you don't need to find a compromise or anything like that if you can just simply have the end users give you their credentials. Um, so this is where uh, training and end user um, knowledge and uh, a really big portion of this can be resolved through 2FA as well. Um, and then the third way is becoming a lot less common, but it does still exist out there is the where the payload is coming in as like a compromised PDF file or something like that, uh, where it's just going to try to ransomware an individual's uh, personal computer and whatever they have access to on the internet. Uh, that kind of attack doesn't really have any 
intelligence behind it. They're literally just throwing it out to millions of people and seeing who clicks. Um, so these are the most common ways that, uh, that that we see people getting getting attacked. I'll let Curtis talk a little bit about uh, some of the the techniques. <laughs> Great. Yeah. So I had already mentioned um, the SSL certs that might be on a Microsoft website. Uh, there's this one tool out there called Evil Jinx, and it's the latest thing. Um, it acts as a man in the middle where the phishing email sends you to a link or a domain, and it actually will log you into the Microsoft site. So it looks completely transparent to a user. Uh, but it does scrape, again, the username, password, and in that case, it's even the 2FA tokens. Um, very difficult to spot unless you're, again, looking at the domain name. So uh, one of our main points is in here is, is be aware, be very aware of, of what you're clicking on. Uh, these tools that are out there, they're, they're very easy for somebody to learn. We used to call them script kitties. Someone that was considered non-technical that could just find something on the internet that could run to attack um, a site. The tools are just out there all over the place now, and it really doesn't take very much. Uh, we mentioned that the people who are doing this are running as a business. Um, the leaders of this might not be technical, and they'll have somebody in the background that, that actually does the, the technical part of it. Uh, changing your passwords after being hacked is good and necessary, but barely scratches the surface. Um, yeah, Wim, did you have anything to add to that one? Uh, nope. No, we, we could speak an hour on this one. There's so yeah. much going on yeah. there. I, I think the, the one thing that I would highlight is that point, uh, and hence the title of the webinar, what we just did, um, all of those computers that we were working on, Lucy's and the server, um, those were devices that were behind a standard business grade firewall with antivirus running. Um, because this, these techniques use the fundamental functionality of the operating system, this is the way it's supposed to work. Um, your antivirus and firewall are not going to prevent this attack. It has to be your business IT best practices that prevents this. Uh, wait, um, uh, yeah, so on that note, <laughs> uh, yeah, so what are some of those best practices, Ian? Uh, so it is important to have a proper business grade firewall. Uh, What's more important about that is that it is configured correctly. If you have the best and most expensive firewall in the world and you open up an RDP port through that firewall, that firewall is going to do nothing for you. However, if you have the ability to configure that RDP port through uh, 2FA or IP whitelisting or VPN or things like that, uh, that mitigates these kinds of attacks. So having a business grade firewall is great. It needs to be configured correctly. Uh, centrally managed anti-malware is also important. Um, modern antivirus does look for things uh, and certain types of behaviors. So maybe the compromise of the network, it's not going to protect against. But once a application starts rapidly accessing thousands of files and encrypting them, the antivirus identifies that as ransomware behavior and shuts it down. Um, really important here is for end users not to have local administrative access to their PCs. If they have to have some kind of a service account that allows them to launch particular applications, uh, maybe um, if they if you've got a remote user that needs to have an administrative account that they know that they can log into. Uh, when they need to do a task out on the road, maybe something like that can be better. Um, but your daily driver account that a person uses every day cannot be an administrator on, account, on an account. Uh, keeping your servers and workstations patched is really important. Uh, we quite often see servers that haven't been rebooted in months or years when we come onto an environment initially. Um, every single week, there's a a number of exploits that are put out there 
that are fixed by the vendors every day. Um, and those patches are released often, at least mon monthly. So keeping all of your equipment up to date is important. Um, Two-factor authentication is a really big por portion of your modern protection. Uh, whether that's 2FA for Office 365 uh, or 2FA for your local computer um, through some third-party product, uh, 2FA is really important and really helps to trim down on these kinds of attacks. Uh, and the important thing to remember is that best practice is constantly changing. Um, 15 years ago, it was considered pretty normal to do what we just demonstrated here today with choosing a random high-level port and posting it out on the internet. Um, then there's organizations that came along and said, you know what, we're just going to scan the entire internet and post it out there on the for everybody to look at. And they do that, and they're ongoing. Um, it's no obscurity is no longer valid for security. Uh, we have to be a lot more proactive than that. So understanding that best practices change constantly and just because you did something last year and it was best practice doesn't mean it will be again next year. So be, uh, be prepared to evolve with the industry. Um, I think that's kind of the big points there. Yep, thanks Ian. Yeah, so I want to go through some of the, the top 10 objections and myths. And uh, I, I've heard or we've heard as a team from clients from prospects picking or yeah, well, why not to do more security? And they say like two-factor authentication is a pain because you need something on your keychain or an app on your phone and it's all these extra steps and you got to wait. If it's set up properly, it's you don't even need to unlock your phone. It can just pop up and you, you click on the proofs. You're not even typing in the six-digit code with some of the apps. Um, and they can be configured not to ask you for every every single hour, but once a day or once a week. So it's really, it's an extra two seconds for a ton of peace of mind. Uh, complex passwords are a pain. And if you're using 2FA or some of these other techniques is, and you're using a password manager, you're not actually typing in these long, random, unique passwords all the time. And then having a password that's easy to remember can also be achieved where it's not completely random characters and number signs and dollar signs and everything that's really hard to type and remember, but it could be um, long, but really easy to remember using some some acronyms or different things so that you can, your memory kicks in the password really easily. So we, we can help on that. Uh, not having local admin is a pain. There, that's, we get a lot of, that's a big pushback we get. It's like, I need it to install programs or to set up printers or to run my program. And it's just a bit of extra work. We can streamline that, that the users can run as a local user without the administrative permissions. That can be worked around. Too many steps, too much to remember. Um, it's really mindset um, around that. We, we go through a million steps in a day and we don't freak out about that. So we can certainly add two or three more steps to be more secure. Coming back to the local admin, uh, our perspective is not the end user's core job to manage their computer, it's IT's job. So have the right people doing it, um, patching it and dealing with security and the permissions. Uh, adding bureaucracy, people are worried about that, about the policies and procedures, but really those exist around HR and accounting and other things for a good reason. So what is the gap generally accepted accounting principles equivalent for IT and security? It's not really out there, but there are still best practices and policies to follow, and that's where we help navigate it. Another one is my employees don't have time for training. They're busy doing their jobs. Well, do you have time for downtime? Do you have time to be down for a week while your network's being recovered? Another one is uh, we won't get hacked because we don't have a server. We're just using cloud data like uh, SharePoint or Dropbox. Well, a lot of these techniques will work with that as well. Um, and in fact, it can be easier to compromise your cloud data. You don't have to get through a firewall and other things. It's just, if you've got the password and the credential, just go in there and um, steal data, sell it, encrypt it, um, really ruin your day. Yes, it could be recovered by going into the cloud console and rolling it back, but it takes time and you can't serve your customers in that meantime. It's not in the budget. Well, prevention is cheaper than the headache, the stress, the embarrassment, the time, the costs of a compromise. And some of the statistics out there are that 60% of companies that get hacked don't return to business. 
uh, or perhaps we, we hear, well, we have insurance, it'll cover us if we get hacked. Um, but the insurance providers are actually requiring more protection. There's more disclaimers. Uh, they're covering their butts more and more. They're increasing premiums. And they rarely cover that loss of productivity and reputation damage. So they might cover the cost for an IT company to get you up and going, but they're not going to cover your loss of sales and sending your people home, whatever it might be. And finally, we all we hear from some clients that so they get, hey, my team is really careful with opening, opening emails and not clicking on stuff they shouldn't. But how do you measure that and how do you educate them? How do you know they're not clicking on stuff? They're just unaware, they're innocent of that they just gave their password away. They think it's just, hey, it's just business as usual. They don't even realize it. So those are 10 things there. And so top 10 easy tips you can take away today is just being paranoid. So hover, yeah, whether it's the emails you get, the, the links you click on, um, some of the, these, they're, these hackers are using psychologists now to write the email. It's not all uh, full of spelling mistakes and bad grammar. They're formatted really nicely. They, they look like the real thing, like a real Amazon shipping notification or Canada Post thing. And they trap people. Be careful with free Wi-Fi, whether it's an airport or a restaurant or something out there, because they can man in the middle, sniff your traffic, redirect you. So be careful when you're going to banking sites, your email, different things. Um, be, uh, type in Earl's. Um, addresses for websites uh, just be really careful when you click on the links and emails um, it's better to just go to your bank's website and log in than to click what looks like an email coming from the bank um, well what we saw with a customer maybe a year or two years ago is the hacker registered a, a typo domain where um, instead of a M in the middle of the domain they use a RN so if you see it on your screen it looks totally the same depending on your font, but it looks like the real thing. So they're really sneaky with that. Um, to hover over the link, but if in doubt, just type it in or delete, delete the email or don't do it. Um, yeah, if you get an email for like a funds transfer or a password reset or from, in quotes, IT asking you to do something, just confirm it verbally, give them a call uh, and that. And if you re if you reply back to them, it could be compromised. So it might look like your vendor, but it's not the vendor. There's somebody in between. Don't install unknown software that you're downloading online. Don't let your kids use your work computer or use your home computer for that the, your kids' computer, family computer for work. And be really careful with sharing that way. Use different passwords for every website, which if you're trying to remember it, um, that's again possible. You need a, a password manager like LastPass keep pass, there's different ones out there. And definitely need to be different and complex as well. And it, we, we don't like to see passwords being stored in a Word document or an Excel file, which could be compromised and they still have the keys to the castle that way. Password manager I mentioned, and yeah, finally don't send money to that Nigerian prince who's stuck and wants to get out of prison or whatever the story is. Okay. Uh, I'm going to keep this moving. What to look for in cybersecurity insurance. There's a lot to it. We just updated our cyber policy uh, earlier this year and realized I thought we had full coverage and realized we didn't really have much at all. So we, we revamped it. It doesn't cost a whole lot more. It's like another thousand bucks a year, I think I pay for us. And um, a lot more peace of mind of what it covers. Um, Again, covering every possible scenario is like quite expensive, but you can definitely get it up there to cover the main things to recover your systems, cover all your direct costs and such. Um, so example is what if we can't recover you from backups because your backups were bad or it's just a USB drive, it's not an online encrypted backup and you've lost that completely. Then if your team has to re-enter from paper or call customers and get data and re-enter it from scratch, what does that look like? That could be, yeah, very expensive. A forensic audit to determine what happened. That's That could be $30,000 on its own. Might still be uh, inconclusive as to the result, but yeah, there's, the insurance can cover that cost. They'll hire an uh, IT forensic audit or auditor to get into that. Ransoms, the extortions. Also, ransoms are always paid through BitTorrent, or not BitTorrent, uh, Bitcoin. So you, we really never know who that is. It could be across the world. It could be down the street. You don't know who it is. Business downtime, mentioned that. 
incidentals, notification costs. There's a lot of laws coming out that you got to notify your clients if their data has been compromised, fines and penalties. And make sure you update it every couple of years because there's new coverage available and the uh, fine print changes. So some main things to take away is you need to have multiple layers to security. It's not just a firewall, the antivirus. It's not just a two-factor authentication. You're good to go. You need a lot of different policies and tools and process and a mindset. Awareness and education for everyone. You still need the good tools. Don't neglect the firewall and the antivirus. And you need monitoring to know when you've been compromised and just being proactive with checklists and so forth. So yeah, quick pul uh, pulse check. Um, so yeah, out of a scale, just think for yourself, out of a scale of one to 10, how, how do you feel your current security level is? Is it a five out of 10 and or two out of 10 or eight out of 10? And where do you want to get it to? Considering 10 out of 10 of being a Fort Knox is perhaps just not feasible. But how do you go, how do you go from a five to a seven or a two to a five? So yeah, what's the, in the chat, I invite you to post one thing you're going to do this week to improve security, even if it's a small step, like asking us a question, researching something, having a conversation with your provider, or booking a call, or getting an audit, or just asking somebody a question. All right. Uh, <laughs> 10 to 11. <laughs> you can check that one off. What's the next <laughs> one you're going to do? <laughs> but yeah, keep this moving forward. Uh, OK, so we've got some questions coming in here. Um, yeah, uh, any other questions? Oh, wait, my, yeah, so I've got some more slides. But um, while I'm going through that, yeah, please post questions down below, and we'll get to it. Uh, so I would invite uh, everyone to a security consultation call and where we can talk about where are you at. Are you at a 5 out of 10, a 2 out of 10? We've got questions around ransomware, password managers, whatever it might be, and we can go right through that and assess you just be verbally, we're not going into your systems, but just discussing it. And we may, we'll ask you questions you may not know, but that's where we can dig into that and see what really what's going on. And then we can do a customized project from that to really look at all your systems, your policies, procedures, and give recommendations from there. And we just ask that as both a decision maker and a technical contact on the phone, if possible, so we can get some real answers. And some of this is included with our existing TLC services if you're an existing client on the call today. So to take advantage of this, this would be a call with most likely myself and either Ian or Curtis, depending on whether you're a Linux or a Windows client, and we can dig into that. So if you want to do that, just um, shoot me an email and we'll get that going. Oh, great. So my questions are actually back here. Any other questions? Um, I will go through Bill's question here. Uh, historically, our data server has been available only via local network in the archive building. As a result of remote work requirements, we're in the process of setting up remote online access to the data server for our volunteers. Uh, definitely a common thing today. Are there any particular issues or concerns for this scenario and recommended precautions? And um, yeah, let's go to Curtis. I think you're more familiar with this client setup. Yeah, my first thought is just how are the volunteers getting into the network? Um, would they be accessing it through a VPN? Or alternately, is there a firewall in place that has a whitelist of IPs? Uh, those are the first questions that I would ask. So yes, we can whitelist IP addresses. So we can do additional two-factor authentication login. We can look at VPN, SSL, yeah. of course, to protect the website. Yeah, same thing with the VPN with uh, multi-factor built into it. Yeah. OK. Uh, thank you. I'll mark that. And then Holly has a question about recommended password manager. Uh, Ian, what do you recommend? Um, I would say that uh, for the most part, all of the professional commercial grade password managers are, for all intents and purposes, equal. Um, whether it's LastPass or KeepPass, uh, you can just investigate. Um, there's one password is another one. 
uh, if you're using services um, like, for example, it might be built into your computer. If you're using an Apple product, there is uh, Apple Keychain, which is a secure online encrypted password manager. Um, but in general, uh, yeah, just ha have a look at the, the core password managers that are out there. Um, I don't think that we want to be in a position where we're saying use this one, but um, any any of those big ones, LastPass, KeePass, OnePassword, uh, Apple Keychain, any of those uh, could, could be good for you. Yep. Okay. Uh, and then... Plaquila has a question about how do you remove local and min from your regular user account? So somebody has that, uh, which is, as a percentage, I'd say it's at least 20, 50% of systems we work on are running local and min, it seems like. So how do you move to a local and min setup? Or sorry, or remove the local and min, yeah. So that's going to be basically starting with identifying why administrative access was given to an end user in the first place uh, if there's a piece of app if there's a piece of software that won't run correctly without administrative access um, then generally we begin to identify why it is that the computer can't run without administrative access maybe it needs access to uh, rather than writing to the user folder for system changes, it writes to the program directory and a standard user doesn't have access to make changes to the program directory. So we would be able to identify, for example, just the files that required administrative access and grant a user permission to them rather than giving them permissions to the entire computer. Uh, a lot of times it might have been for an old piece of software that's not in use anymore. Um, and to be honest, in this day and age, I would um, strongly recommend looking at alternative vendors if your software vendor requires administrative access for your end users and does not update their software. If you're working on legacy software, um, it might be time to start looking at a change. Um, but there's very very few occasions have i ever come across where it was impossible to not to remove administrative access or at least not make the system vastly more secure than just simply running your daily driver account as an administrator okay thank you uh any other questions we got a couple more minutes we're at the top of the hour um but uh, yeah, uh, please feel free to should, uh, post in the chat or email us your top takeaways from this, what you're going to do or what you learned from this or what kind of shock you're going through it or how easy it is to compromise a network. Um, with that, I will wrap this up. And thank you for your time today. And make it a great afternoon or evening, wherever you are in this world. And talk to you soon. Thank Thanks, you, everyone. everyone. Yep, bye now.